Greetings to you on this sixth Sunday of Easter. Alleluia. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. By way of introduction to this message, which I believe the Lord has laid on my heart to share, is uh, what the Jewish prophets described the people of their time as grape vines. Grape vines. And instead of producing the fruit of righteous attitudes and actions, the people produce the opposite. Listen to the words of these Old Testament prophets. These were not in today's readings in our lectionary. But in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says this, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says this, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? My word today is that Jesus can transform us at the root so that you and I can bear fruit. Jesus can transform us at the root so that you and I can bear fruit. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name today. Lord, we love you. We exalt you. We worship you and we lift you up. God, we ask in the next few moments, would you release the presence and the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit? Would you confront us, challenge us, change us, and draw us closer to you? And to that end, I'm available to you, Lord, to use me according to your will. Would you stand in my body, think with my mind, and speak with my tongue? And then, Lord, you receive all the honor, glory, and praise, for you alone are worthy. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. So I'm going to be reading from our gospel lesson appointed for today, uh, which is John chapter 15, verses uh, 1 and following. And uh, the Bible says this, Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Let me stop right there. The people in the metaphor, Jesus uses this metaphor to make a point. The spiritual life is like a vineyard. Any vineyard, any vineyard needs a vine, needs a gardener, needs branches, and if you're doing it correctly, ideally some fruit. And Jesus explicitly identifies the parts of the metaphor in verses 1 and 5, in that Jesus is the vine, God the Father is the vine dresser or the gardener, and you and I, we, the people of God, are the branches. Okay, let's continue. Verse 2. Uh, John 15, verse uh, 2. The Bible says this, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, that it may bear more fruit. Okay, let me stop right here. There is pain in this metaphor. There's no way around it. There is pain in this metaphor from Jesus. To put it another way, if you don't bear fruit, you will come under the knife. And if you do bear fruit, you will come under the knife. The pruning will still cause us pain. Jesus might prune something out of our life that we're quite fond of. Maybe it's a habit that we enjoy or something um, that gives us identity. We think it's really important. We think it's something that we cannot live without. 
but we must trust that the gardener knows what he's doing. And he prunes with a purpose that you and I might be even more fruitful. Look in verse 3, John 15, verse 3, the Bible says this, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Let me stop right here just for a moment by way of illustration. Once you come to the point where you've paid off a loan, whether it's for a car or paid off the mortgage, whether it's for a house, and you get that deed in your hands that says that you are finally the proud owner of your car or your house, practically speaking, I advise you to stop making payments to the bank. <laughs> Jesus has already paid the debt that makes us clean before God the Father. And I'm speaking to myself in that we need to stop paying a debt that has already been paid. Stop trying to cleanse yourself when Jesus already sees you and he already sees me as cleansed. You see, a trick of the enemy is that he wants us to believe that we are not clean. We can be prevented from bearing fruit because of an overdeveloped sin consciousness. And the enemy will constantly bring your sin. He will bring my sin to our remembrance. You remember when you did such and such? Well, you know when you lost your temper and you just flew off the handle. The enemy is described as the accuser of the brethren. And what is the... What is the point of that? The point of that is that we're overly occupied trying to make ourselves righteous, and that is self-righteousness. Jesus is trying to bring our forgiveness to our remembrance for what he has accomplished once and for all on the cross. What he's trying to do is counteract it with the declaration in that you and I are already clean, thanks be to God. And that cleansing only happens because we are branches that are connected to the true vine. And that is the word. That is the word that is spoken to us. Look in verses uh, 4 and 5. John 15, verses 4 and 5, Abide in me as I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me stop right here for a moment. This is the main point of this discourse, that you and I must abide in Christ. The word abide appears seven times in these eight verses from our gospel lesson appointed for today. The concept of abiding is one of total dependence, total dependence. If the branch is separated from the vine, it dies. It might look nice for a little while, but it, it, it immediately stops growing and it starts to die. The branch cannot do it on its own. The branch cannot survive on its own. The same thing is true for you and I spiritually. Unless you and I abide in Christ, we die spiritually. The life does not come from the branch, from how hard the branch works, or how hard it wants to be fruitful. The life comes from the vine. And the life in our spirit comes from Jesus and our connectedness to him. And it is only in him 
that we will bear fruit for the kingdom of God. So how do we abide in Christ? That seems to be the major point in this metaphor. So how do we abide in in Christ? How do we stay connected to the vine and the life that comes from it? Especially when, as one of my favorite hymns says, and it breaks my heart every time because it is our, it is in our nature. From come thou fount of every blessing, it reminds us that you and I are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. So how do we abide in Christ? Well, number one is we meditate on the word of God. We meditate on the word of God. Certainly an upside from sheltering in place (laughs) has got to be A lot of the things that used to distract us are distractions no longer. The Bible says in John 15, verse 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The word of God truly is a gift to us. It is full of life. It is full of power. It is full of everything we need to know how to live. And when we read God's promises to us, we allow God's presence to flow in us and to fill us with life and to fill us with power. Thanks be to God. So as we're sheltering in place, as we're quarantined, And we have the time. Invest your time in God's word, and you will find yourself abiding in Christ. So we meditate on God's word to abide in Christ. We also need to be in prayer to abide in Christ. We must spend time talking with our Lord and Savior Lord, this is a problem. Lord, this is a struggle. Lord, this is a blessing. Lord, this is whatever it is, just speaking to our friend that the Bible says sticketh closer than a brother. But we also need to make room to be quiet and to be still and to allow God to speak, whether it's through his word, whether it's through the dynamic work of the Holy Spirit coming alive into our hearts or speaking to another person. God also speaks to his people through his people. That's prayer, speaking to him and allowing God to speak back to us. And then, of course, worship. We abide in Christ through meditating on his word, through praying, and also in worship. My Lord, I cannot wait to get back into the house of God to be with the people of God, to be able to sing together. But the life of God flows into us as we sing songs to him and we sing songs about him, but it's not just in the buildings. That's only an hour and change in a week, but it's cultivating lives of worship. And it's not just entertainment, musical praise because of a choir or because of a worship band, but it is flowing from our hearts, worship that flows from our hearts. Not as we sing, not not just because of singing together as a church, but that we cultivate lives of worship that just flow naturally out of us. Lord, you're so good, whether we sing it or we say it. God, you're so good. You're so faithful.
Lord, I, I bless you. The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's cultivating a life of worship. It's not just singing in a building. It's not just singing with the choir. It's not just singing out of a hymnal. But it's allowing this life of worship flowing out of us. These essential spiritual disciplines, meditating on the word of God, praying, developing, cultivating a life of worship, these essential spiritual disciplines keep us connected to that true vine. And it keeps us attached at the source so that the life of God can flow through us. Uh, look in John chapter 15, verse 6. John 15, verse 6, the Bible says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Let me stop right here now. This is a hard word. But there is a judgment coming, and we serve and are connected to the true vine or not. There's no way around it. We're connected to the true vine or not. So this is decently self-explanatory, isn't it? The connection to the true vine gives us life for all eternity, and not being connected to Jesus Christ means separation from him for all eternity. Look in verse 8, John 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let me stop right here for just a moment. Until we are connected at the root, we cannot begin to bear the fruit. Until we are connected at the root, we cannot begin to bear the fruit. You see, the Lord promised us that we would do greater works than he did. That was in last Sunday's gospel lesson appointed for for worship last week. He promised that we would do greater works than he did. God desires for his church to be as big as possible. God desires for his kingdom to be as big as possible. And my passion is to bring those who are disconnected from Christ and his church into new life. And that life only comes from the true vine, the true vine being Jesus. And I pray always that we as a church would be sold out to this vision of bearing much fruit. Christ desires to use all of us to expand his kingdom so that his father may be glorified, as he says in John 15, verse 8. Let me zoom out for a moment and talk about what does this mean to us practically, and then I'll close. There are some practical lessons that we can glean, uh, if you if you like, from uh, Uh, staying true to this metaphor, but we can glean from the grapevine. Number one, grapevines would rather produce shoots and leaves instead of grapes. Grapevines would rather produce shoots and leaves rather than grapes. They look lush and green, but they are only good for making decorations that way. And I think that might be the same for you and I. In that we tend to seek looking good to others more than really doing the hard work of changing or being available to be pruned. Speaking of pruning, another lesson from the grapevine is that grapevines must be pruned radically. We need God to cut out those things in our lives that draw his life out of us. Again, there is pain 
in this metaphor. Thirdly, lessons from a grapevine, branches with no fruit must be removed so they don't draw nutrients away from the grapes. We all have attitudes. We all act in ways that prevent us from being like Jesus. And those attitudes, those actions, they have to go. They must go. And that's where the pruning comes in. And then fourth lesson from the grapevine is that fruitful branches must be pruned back to produce even more grapes. You and I will never stop growing. We will always need to cut out old ways of thinking and acting and replace them with how Jesus wants us to think and how Jesus wants us to behave. Let me wrap up this message by saying this. Are you connected to the vine? Are you feeling the life of God flowing through you as you remain in him? Or are you disconnected? Are you slowly dying, trying to stay in control of life and trying to manage things in your own strength? Keep in mind that there are seasons of pruning, as we saw in today's gospel lesson, in that there are times in our lives where maybe we aren't seeing the fruit, but we know we are remaining in the vine. If that describes you, my word to you today is abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Hold fast to him. Abide in him. Continue to let Jesus' words dwell in you. Allow the gardener to prune and cling to the promise that you will bear much fruit. But if you're not connected, I urge you to allow God to, to graft you back into the vine. You see, God is a master gardener, and he can graft us back into the vine. How do we do this? Simply confess that to the Lord and allow him to minister to you through his Holy Spirit. You know, the Alpha Course reminds us so brilliantly and so simply, it is a matter of three words Sorry, please, and thank you. Sorry, Lord, that I have fallen away from you. Please, would you come into my heart and live within me as you promise? And then thank you, Jesus, for doing this work through the power of your Holy Spirit. Sorry, please, and thank you. Return to him. Surrender yourself to him, every part of you, and let Jesus' life fill you up to overflowing, because it is God's glory that we bear much fruit. It is to his glory that we bear much fruit, demonstrating that we are his disciples, and it is God's desire that we remain in him, connected allowing his life to flow in us and to produce fruit for his kingdom. Let's pray. Oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.